you'd like to contact the show, send us an email at liveonfourlegspodcast at gmail.com or get involved in the conversation on social media. Join the Pearl Jam Podcast community group on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Live on Four Legs Pod. I don't know if you can see, but I, I've noticed that Mike, Mike McCready, more than ever, he's got balls tonight. Five balls tonight. And I, I've got one. I, I had one cut off so I could hit the high notes. That's what I did. <clears throat> Sacrifice for music is what I did. And away we go. You're listening to Live on Four Legs, the live Pearl Jam podcast experience featuring... Mr. Stone Gossett! Fucking camera in the truck. everybody now welcome to live on four legs a definitive live pearl jam podcast and we are now just about a month away until we get september shows so of course if you were around in may what we did in may was we took a couple of the locations that they were heading to some of them they didn't actually end up going to like sacramento and vegas obviously but we are going to do our best to make sure that all these cities that we talk about in the next couple weeks are ones that they will definitely play in September. And today we're going to start off with Camden. And as y'all know, especially if you were supposed to have tickets to the Baltimore show, oh, you know about this because Baltimore, it got cut, it got canceled. And now they're playing in Camden this year for the first time since 2008. But we're going to go into a little bit of the history about Camden and why it's one of the bigger places that Pearl Jam plays in their history. Let's talk about it. Randy Sobel over here, John Farrar over there. Hello, hello. Before we talk about all of what I just mentioned, I think that the big news, and and I don't know if you want to call it big, but the news that happened this week is that Ed's back. Ed's back, Ed has a voice, and came out and played with the Strokes. What do you think about that? Um... What's what's he doing? Like it's only been two weeks since he's Amsterdam. He's fine. He's fine. We record this, and he did that a few days ago. He's not supposed to be doing that, <sighs> if I remember correctly. I didn't like, watch who, this because I didn't. Who want told to him he couldn't do that? He said at that thing like they, he was he was not supposed to. He was going to be allowed to t- to sing. I didn't think that that was quite truthful and he hmm. kind of says something sometimes and he's like yeah well i'm not gonna sing and then if he finds an opportunity like this he's like oh okay sure i'll jump well, in, jump in what's one song what's one song got to but do? like why would you risk it dude like you just had to cancel three shows with your own band why would you go like i know it's the chili peppers and like he's super fan and like he's friends with the strokes obviously he was obviously going to beat the show they probably were like Hey, dude, come on and do do the thing that you do with us. Come on and sing the song. And he's probably like, oh, you know, I shouldn't. Oh, come on, do it. Come on. Like, oh, okay. But, like, you've got to be smarter than that. Like, why risk it? Like, yeah, I mean, obviously he can, he can still go take 
three or four weeks off after this, and uh, hopefully it'll be fine. But if problems come up, people are going to point back to that and be like, what was he doing? Just just don't do it. Just go to the show. Have a good time. Don't get up and sing. That I, I didn't watch it because I didn't want to get mad. I don't know. It's one song. It's one song. I yeah. don't think that one song is going to hurt you, going to kill you. Shows. Yeah, but not because of one song, because of a whole series of events yeah. that happened. I know. He's he, supposed he to be recovering, this... though. It's, you, the, the whole point was he's supposed to be taking care of this thing. He's supposed to be taking it seriously. But he it does. Just... It's it's not like he has a whole month of August worth of shows to do. I, I think that's kind of. I know. That, that's what I said. But I'm saying if you're taking a risk, because if they're comes back in September and there's issues people are going to look back go to this to that moment being like it's going to be one of the things that like point out like hey he wasn't resting when he was supposed to be resting that's all I'm saying I don't even know if they cancel Quebec City that I'm going to go back to this and say it's the reason why I think this this is just small this is just small having fun like yeah I get it yeah maybe he shouldn't be singing a lot this isn't a lot however he he does have to go and and he does have to rehearse with the band at some point, so maybe this was kind of the rehearsal of the rehearsal. I have no mm-hmm. idea. I don't just just saying. Sometimes uh, guys kind of have to prepare themselves in all different ways. And Ed's sort of this weird creature of habit. If he's not doing something for X amount of time, then he feels like he has to take the need to 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 do it. And I guess that this was a little bit of what it is. And, you know, coming off of Amsterdam, knowing that it wasn't a hundred percent and going into this, just saying, let's see if I got it. Let's see if it's working. Is that a fine? Is that a great, this is, that's <sighs> how Ed was supposed to sound. You know, I, don't like, get it. I think you're being a little bit of an apologist, but I, no, no I just, I'm not being an apologist just, at all. I just don't get it. I don't understand why you would do it after, after what happened. Just take, just rest your voice dude. That's all I'm saying. I wouldn't call it an apologist. I would just call it like, I, I just don't think that one song for three minutes matters. I just Hopefully don't. it won't. Hopefully it won't. If he played an entire set with them, then I'd be like, okay, yeah, you know, now you're putting yourself in jeopardy. But no, this was, this is one song. This is one song. I, I have I have no issue with that. If he did it every single night, if he was like joining the tour just to sing juice box with them, I'd say, yeah, that's, that's, you know, you're putting yourself in trouble a little bit, but it's one song. I don't think that this is going to be the reason if he does have to cancel the show at some point during this tour, I don't think it's going to be this. I think it's going to be all of what happened in the shows before well, that. Came right, together but I'm, I'm, I'm saying I'm going to look back on this as an indicator that he wasn't taking care of it. Like he was supposed to be doing, it would be an indication of a bigger problem. But yeah, hopefully if you, you can choose to look at it that way, you can choose to look at it the the half full version where, hey, he's been seeing doctors, he's been doing great, the voice sounds good. He wanted to get out there and show people that he's he's back, he can still sing, he wanted to make an appearance and be like, Hey, no worries, I'm back. We're 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 good to go. So maybe you can look at it either way. I but when I when I first heard about it, I was like, Oh, do not don't do that. Don't don't do that. Just rest. So, yeah, I mean, I'm sure he had a lot of fun. Two bands he likes. Have a blast. Yeah, hopefully it won't make a difference. Now I'm in search of the Chili Peppers shirt that he was wearing because that's something <laughs> that I had back uh, during the By the Way tour. I definitely bought that shirt, and hmm. I texted with Matt. I'm like, this is a shirt that I had, right? And he's like, we both had it. We both had this shirt. And now going to check on eBay and all those places, it's like 50 bucks to 100 bucks though so, yeah like, what, what, what happened to yours it just get like just disappeared over uh, the years well yeah i think that you know once music tastes change and kind of once you know laundry sure. gets mixed up and everything like that I, I don't have every old band shirt that i've ever owned unfortunately I, i've had a lot of great ones i've had a lot of really unique ones but uh that one was definitely in a heavy rotation for a solid at least three to four oh. years and sometimes these things just happen okay. uh let's talk a little bit about camden as mentioned this is going to be the first time since 2008 however you might not believe this this is in the top five venue that pearl jam has played in all time did you know that or i, w- I would not have guessed that the but other yeah yeah they, they played there a lot 
The others are Shoreline is the first. Mm-hmm. MSG, I think, is behind this. Even I, they're actually tied. There's the Rod Laver Arena in Australia. Okay, yeah, yeah, Melbourne, I think. Right. Yeah, um, they did a couple of three night stands there. Yep, that it yeah. makes total sense. And I don't even think the Key Arena is on this list. It's something else. Hmm. Yeah, I'd have to go back and look, but I know for a fact Camden is on this list. So when they're going to be back there September 14th, it's going to be the 11th time. So a lot of these are like, you know, double nights, 2008, two nights, and here in 2006, two nights. Right, right. So they've, you know, being close to Philadelphia, they've obviously have a great audience there. And it's not, well, I guess it's one of those things where you don't really expect it, but however, it is a bigger area. It's just kind of where the location is. You're pulling in Philadelphia people, you're pulling in Jersey people, et cetera, et cetera. So, but I don't know if I see this as being a destination place for Pearl Jam. Yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think of it as being one of the go-to places, but I mean, yeah, I mean, I think it's like, what, just across the river from Philadelphia. So right. I think even in this show, he says, he in wish list, he says in Philadelphia's hands. And it's like, dude, you're not, you're not there. You're in, you're in a different state, but close enough. I it's, guess. Um, yeah, it's, yeah. it's really stone's throw. But yeah. the the issue with Camden is that it's, uh, it's not the safest area in the world. It, it could kind of add into all of that, but however, Jersey fans don't really mind that sort of thing, I don't think. Probably not. Because we stumbled upon something on YouTube that, you know, it seems like <laughs> a gem of a of a video clip here. There's a little home movie happening where it's just a bunch of guys hanging out, tailgating, and, and honestly, some girls. There's there's some there, there are a couple of girls yeah, in there too. There are, of course. And the whole thing, they, they, he mentions Pearl Jam in the beginning of this, but you could have shown the entire rest of the clip to anybody else and said, okay, what band are they tailgating for? And maybe Pearl Jam would have been like your 50th guess, you know? Like, this could have been any band that they could have been doing this during. Yeah, you know, I, I don't, don't think I saw a shirt. I don't think I saw, heard a mention. Right. I don't know if you've ever seen Heavy Metal Parking Lot or any of the many iterations of that that followed. But, you know, the story of Heavy Metal Parking Lot is like they went and filmed, I think it was like Iron Maiden or Judas Priest or something. They just filmed, it was like 1984 or whatever, and just filmed a bunch of people in the parking lot, like interviewed them, kind of like this, home movies, like drinking and stuff like that. And it's hilarious. And this reminded me of a little bit of that. And like someone should totally do Pearl Jam, parking lot with with these guys because it's like just getting drunk and random people coming in and yelling at them there's at one point near the end there's some big guy comes in and he's yelling oh, things God. and they even put like a little caption underneath with question marks like who knows what this dude is saying yeah but it, it gives you a good puts you right in the frame of mind before listening to the show to kind of get you can almost smell the PBR, whatever they were drinking, the the dollar beer, um, whatever they were shotgunning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll it'll, it'll get you ready for for the show for sure. Yeah, I'd highly recommend taking the uh, five minutes if you're going to listen to this bootleg and check it out. Well, you're mentioning something, and then I'm thinking I don't know exactly what my plans are going to be for the Camden show. I will have a video mm-hmm. camera in hand. Okay. Okay. So. There aren't going to be a lot of shows that I'll be tailgating at. I do know that for a fact. Maybe we'll make this one of them. Interesting. I have another thing that I, I was asked about if I if I can go to. I don't. I haven't heard about it in a while, so we'll we'll just have to see how it all plays out. But the people who were, if you're out there, if you were you were in this video, please yeah, let please, us know. please let us. We know. would love to talk to you. The funniest thing that I think that came out of this was when the guy said, I almost ate a penny and I thought it was a pretzel. Yeah. yeah. That's all you need to know. Yeah. Lots of porta potty talk, uh, a dude bumping the girls drink over lots of shotgunning, drunken stupidness, throwing footballs around wrestling, barbecuing. Like it's everything that you would expect from any normal New Jersey tailgate. 
it's on YouTube. If you just search Pearl Jam Camden 2006, it's like the third thing that comes up. You'll see like a couple people in a parking lot with a bridge in the background. So it's much better than the actual clips from the show that are on there. This is the, <laughs> yeah. this is right before the iPhone era. There's a lot of flip phones, right. a lot of very bad quality videos from this. So not a full video on this one, unfortunately. All right. Well, we have a preset we actually get to talk about here. And we haven't talked about like a legitimate preset in a while. And we're going to get Ed coming out first before everybody else. And then it's going to transition into my morning jacket. And he comes out and he says, I imagine all of us had come from church. And it's Ed on electric doing throw your arms around. primer for the night it's maybe not the perfect sing-along that gets everybody involved but it's one where you know you can get invested into what ed's doing and ed's really shattering with the vocals there and it feels effortless like his voice was in great shape in 2006 and it was a great performance you don't get a lot of this song especially like presets you get it sometimes but this seems like it's more of the rare preset sort of song it did happen this year which is nice but yeah. always happy to have it oh yeah i i love this whenever it shows up there is video of this as well and it's probably the only video worth watching from the show yeah absolutely fantastic i love the you know he's not only playing an uh, electric guitar there but it's a rickenbacker as well which always kind of stands out to me it has a really good sound for this song and it sounds amazing i absolutely love this a plus Look, they're just going to go right into my morning jacket and Ed's going to stay on stage. He's going to do a song with them. It says, since we don't know when we'll meet again, hat tip to what he just sang, let's get this night started. Here's my morning jacket. We're going to do one together. The song is called It Makes No Difference. I'm not a big my morning jacket fan, and I don't think you are either. No, no, I'm not. I Look, they're one of these bands where I know I've heard them multiple times and i haven't hated what i heard but i don't retain this band very well if you know what i mean i think we've seen this before on this tour this was kind of the song that he was coming out and doing with them yeah so i had listened to it before and but this is the only my morning jacket song that i've ever listened to and i skimmed through this one to kind of hear you know what it sounded like and it was just kind of a standard thing and doesn't really do anything for me i know people out there love them that's that's great more power to you uh, it's just not my thing. I really like the song, but if you played it for me again, I might not have a memory of it. That's the problem with this band. It sometimes just happens with jam bands. Like, they're yeah, kind of yeah. fringe jam, I, you know, but it just kind of, you know, unless I really get repetition and really, really like it, then it's going to drag me in, I guess. But it's a tough band for me to, to figure out. But... I don't necessarily mind the music if that makes any sense to anybody. MMJ, obviously, a lot of people out there probably got into them. A lot of Pearl Jam fans that got into MMJ probably got into them on this tour because that, you know, they were starting to make a name for themselves and it felt like Pearl Jam was able to to lift them to the next level. And they've done it with so many other bands that give more power to him, more credit, and obviously Ed going out there and singing a song with them makes it happen and puts attention on him. So, 
Main set here. We're going to start the show. The band enters the stage to, I believe it sounded like Master Slave, and I believe it was Master Slave. And it's going to go directly into Wash. <laughs> People out there know the history of Wash, but at this recent time period from about 2003 to this moment in 2006, it had been played five or six times in total, but three of those times was in this area. The first one being in Hondal, we've talked about that before. That's the Pizza Box show. The other time in 2005 was opening that Philadelphia show. And people might know that show from being the ghost of Mary coming up and making her presence known. And then this time. So Wash has kind of become this area sort of song a little bit. That's interesting. It stuck out to me that Ed was playing the Rickenbacker during Throw Your Arms Around Me because it sounded, maybe I just had it in my head, but Wash to me sounded really jangly, especially at the beginning. And, you know, Rickenbackers are known for kind of that early REM kind of jangly sound. So that kind of like made me do a thing like, okay, maybe Stoner Michael was playing a Rickenbacker here, but no, it's it's a good performance. It starts out a little mellow, then Ed kind of gets into it at the end. So yeah, it was a good version, got to somewhere really good. Yeah, you're right on the mellow part. And I, you know, I, I go back to like this time period and listening to versions of this and the Mexico City one in 2003 is like maybe one of the best washes of all time outside of speed wash. But like the intensity that came from that version, I don't, I don't know if I'm expecting that here, but because you notice that it is mellow in the beginning and it does, it does ramp up at the end, but you're like, ooh, where's that magic, that intensity that they had on that Mexico City version? It doesn't have to be on every single one, but yeah, I don't know if it was lacking that edge or not, but uh, that's kind of the standard bear that I'm talking about here. Okay, Go is gonna follow up and it's a combo that I'm not sure if we've ever heard before. However, I know that we have. I have no recollection of it though. This was the beginning of the encore of the Showbox 1996 show. Hmm, Bet you couldn't remember that. No, I would not have guessed that. That's cool, though. And it happened one other time opening a show, I believe, somewhere in 2005 in that Canadian tour. It does a nice job of bottling up all that power. and, And then the end obviously gets charged up and gets you prepared for this kind of sizable show here. And it's this is going to be a show that has a lot of forward momentum that has, every song is kind of feeding off of the last one and it, it's it's a fast show it's a it's a hard rocker show and go is a great one obviously to define what this night's going to be yeah i thought the ending was the highlight it, you know mike just waiting for his moment here you know it, the first time you hear mike at a show is usually the best moment it kind of sets the tone for how the night's going to go and he comes in on go just like oh just like flattens you back in your chair very very good ending to go wash into go not something that you you think of all the time but it works really well here yep three times that's it three times only now let's get into the next two which are going to be worldwide suicide severed hand here's just a crazy thing about this show there are eight songs from the avocado record and you'd never know it because they are so spread out that it is easy to forget 
that this is like the avocado show. And, and I say that because, you know, a lot of 2006 shows we've decided to stay away from because the idea of looking at that set list and seeing the first five songs being life wasted, worldwide suicide, severed hand, Mark and San Coma, like, cause a lot of shows were bombarded with the avocado songs very early on. And usually anywhere from like nine to 10 of them, it's, it's in there a lot. This one just felt really paced out this show where, yeah, there's eight songs in it, but this is a double up here. Then a couple songs later, you get army reserve. Then you get gone a little bit later. They're, they're paced that. And you kind of, you can listen to it and kind of forget that this is clearly for the avocado record. Yeah. It made me a little nostalgic for a time when they would do that with a new record. <laughs> wink, wink, nudge, nudge. But yeah, th- I mean, this one, the next one, you know, Worldwide Suicide here being in the number three spot is the one that that makes it stick out, I think, because that's the one that, you know, has kind of disappeared from sets. I think it's been since 2013 or 2014 that they played it. And it sounded kind of flat here, honestly. Like, it didn't have a lot of the dynamics that a, that a song like that needs to, like, push and, like, hit on those those changes and it just felt like they were just kind of running through it because it was you know the single it just didn't didn't really do anything for me severed hand on the other hand again mike solo comes in just electrifies that song and worldwide suicide needed something like that i thought yeah you're not wrong and i think going back to the whole idea of just packaging all those avocado songs early up there it kind of makes worldwide suicide like you're playing it every night maybe the band i wouldn't say they're sick of it but maybe there's just kind of like emotion with it like okay we know we have to put it Mm. in a showcase kind of spot because it is a single and people are into it but that doesn't mean it's going to be like a show stealer every single show and there are good versions of it it's not one of my favorites it hasn't been one of my favorites in quite a while but there are good versions but yeah this one was just kind of it didn't really set things off, but I fully, fully agree with Severed Hand. This was a phenomenal version of it. And then once Mike solo hits, just the heavy guitars behind him. We've seen Ed take a guitar and start playing on the end of it himself. And I believe that's probably what happened here since it sounded so heavy. But yeah, just a lot of energy. Love this performance of Severed Hand. Excellent. stats for you all right go for looking it. at uh looking at live footsteps here as of this show worldwide suicide was the most played avocado song up to this point Nine, 19 times severed hand with 18 life wasted and comatose had 16 and it would still be played 99 more times after this so yeah they, was, they wore there's a lot of shows on this tour and and in 2007 and in 2008 and then they just got tired of it and it, it felt like you know almost like an obligation or something i wonder if they hadn't worn it out if they had used it a little more sparingly would it have gotten you know a little more appreciation from the fans and a little more you know make them miss it a little bit and I, it would have had a longer life but we've talked about wasn't, this wasn't before to be. we talked about this before i think it's one of the things it's yeah. just like the theme is so stuck in 2006 that when obama was elected president it's kind of easy to forget or you kind of want to forget that error a little bit so yeah it, it kind of made this feel like it you know was stuck in that time period and i think the band kind of saw it too because if you don't have 
a reason for it if you don't have a reason to play a song like this. It just being a song about, obviously, what was going on with the war in Iraq, it might not click if you play it in 2016 that people are going to be like, oh, well, what's this? Some people would love it because I know a lot of people love this record, but it just doesn't quite have the juice that it did in 2006. Yeah, yeah and I, I wonder, you know, and I'll see it sometimes if we're doing a set list thread for a show or something someone will be like oh i hope they play worldwide suicide or i'd really like to hear it I'll be like, oh yeah that, that that that's a song it's it's probably in my bottom 10 and i wonder what the reaction would be if they were to bring it back on this upcoming run of shows if it were to just be people would actually that with excited. kind of like indifference like oh okay i i don't think they'll bring it back i think this one's probably done it would get appreciation, but nobody yeah. would want to keep it around. Like one time, one yeah, time yeah. only. Yeah, yeah. Bring it back. Sure. Hmm. I think people would be kind of excited for it. Like I said, a lot of people love this record, but yeah, more than that, if they're feeling it in Nashville and they want to bring it back to Louisville, then you're kind of like, uh, it's, that's just a wasted opportunity for other songs. Let's uh, get to Corduroy and save you. Again, you're starting out with just a lot of electric rockers. Corduroy definitely does its job. Mike's tone in the solo just at echo effect and made oh, it reverberate a little bit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mike's had it, having a good show in this one. And then Save You is just, this is the one where they just turn it up just a little bit. And it's just fast. It's bouncy. The crowd clapping along during the bridge. And then Ed letting it all hang out at the end. Yeah, his voice is in really good shape on this tour and at this show. And that's one of the things he can still do really well. There's but you, something within you. Oh, I was taking control. Yeah, let me in. Get up, let's go. absolutely blistering like on fire one of the highlights from this night it felt like it was turned up fast just loved it this is this is what save you should be ed says good evening philadelphia good evening new jersey good evening northern pennsylvania in the bootleg you can obviously hear somebody from new york say new york new york how about new york why are you forgetting new york he says good evening cuba and on the seventh day, God said, you'll rock your ass off until the crowd comes home. That's the second religious churchy thing he said on this night, which <laughs> is interesting. I don't know what was on his mind. But anyway, we get into this little section here. It's going to be Yield Song, Avocado, Binaural Song, Avocado. And Give It a Fly had a little bit of that delay effect, not close to the album version, but it had sort of the feel that you kind of recognize from that and you know it just felt like they were locked into a groove everything is really tight here army reserve ed makes a toast to the men and women doing their jobs courageously taking orders whether they want to or not had a really nice dynamic between the two guitars here stone is very crunchy mike is very very clean and spacey and then he had like this cool electric staccato part not a song we talk about a whole lot but Maybe it doesn't get enough recognition, but this this was a nice version. I, I, I was into this. Grievance, the Letterman episode is out, and we talked a little bit about it there, and we talked a little bit about, okay, that, they didn't quite hit where this song gets bite. And here it's it's of course it's gonna have all that. This is a fast night. You know, if the crowd is moving for this, if it's a hot night, then people are drenched by this point. That one is picking up steam. Those three, and then we could do Gone kind of on its separate self. 
I agree with Grievance. You know, we, we did talk about it on that Patreon episode, and this one was a little more kind of theatrical. It kind of, like, raises his voice a couple of times to, to emphasize some points, and it felt like, you know, Grievance is one that you got a lot. It kind of ties in with Army Reserve, you know, the being at war theme. And Gone, I thought, too, very good. Stone, I thought, was great on Gone, like, keeping the rhythm, and it sounded great. Uh, you know, we're going to get to... You know, even flow in a minute, but I felt like these songs kind of held their own in this main spot. You know, not ones you would think of. You know, Army Reserve's only been played 31 times, Gone's only been played 42 times, only 7 and 12 respectively as of this show. But yeah, I thought it, the Avocado songs, like being spliced in there, gave it a little more weight and gave it a little more balance. So yeah, like. Yeah, and, and I specifically didn't add Gone into this conversation here because I mm-hmm. thought that it deserved its own spotlight. Sure. And I thought that this was really theatric. You said something about Grievance being theatric, but this, it, you know, just so balanced within going from verse to chorus, verse to chorus, where right when that kind of that build starts to go up and they start strumming into where the chorus is going to go, like this one just soared. This one just had direction to it. And it felt like one of those things where, you know, the cathartic moment that you might have in the crowd. And this song is very, very young at this point, but it felt like it could have had that lifespan of being one of those songs until they decided, "Mm, you know, maybe this doesn't quite connect. Imagine if they didn't play it 42 times. Imagine if it was something that they cherished kind of like an unthought known. It could it could be up to over 100 right now. And it deserves to be. So from a local standpoint, it debuted seven months ago in Atlantic City. So it had another song yeah. with Jersey Connection yeah. right there. Written just there. a yeah. just a fantastic, uplifting, special performance of this. I really enjoyed it. And yeah, it hasn't been played since Moline. Like that's criminal. Like absolutely they should bring back on. You know, obviously it's the part is lifted from the Who, the Nothing is Everything. This does like kind of feel like a Who song. Like it feels like it could have the energy of something like Pinball Wizard or I Can See for Miles or like it's it's got that soaring part to it that that feels like a Who song. Yeah, it's very good. Even flow. How about getting to the solo right off the bat? We have an absolute scorcher for Mike McCree. <laughs> Thank you. 
high-pitched Hendrick effects, maybe some amp feedback there. It's every trick that's in his book, probably playing behind the back for all we know, and maybe playing with his teeth, who the hell knows. But yeah, this is this is a good solo on EV Flow. Yeah, usually the kind of showy ones that he that he takes are not my favorite. Eddie Van Halen's kind of style, Hendrick style. But this one I thought was was more about what Stone was doing. I don't know if you heard near the... I, I did, very like melodic. The, the end of the song, but it, it almost sounds like bells chiming. Like mm-hmm. he's kind of letting like it that. ring and like, yeah, it was it was really, really cool. I'd never heard Stone do something like that on even flow before. It was really, really interesting. Perked my no, attention. You're right. No, definitely something unique for sure. I think everybody kind of had a role to play with it while... Matt's pounding away, segueing into the end. Obviously, this is kind of the time period where that solo comes through. It wasn't in this version, but, you know, with Ed going at the crowd and saying, you guys take it from here, this crowd is is going to be very, very good on these type of songs on this night. Just hold that thought because... Yeah, it's coming. Yeah, Ed, Ed's going to egg them on for a couple things, and they are right there up for the challenge. Ed mentions Mike, obviously, and says he's got more balls than ever. Tonight, he's got five balls. I got one, had one cut off so I can hit the high notes. Sacrifice for music is what I did. And then we get a l- little bit of a mellow section here with UR and wish list. UR is pretty positive vibe. This was nice. And Mike and Matt go off together at the end, which is really cool. Just packaging that duo on the song is perfect. And then... Every Philadelphian's hands up raised for wish list. It's a nice chilled out jam at the end. And I think that most people know that this is the era where Ed is always kind of doing that improv about being the president and ending all the wars. And we get nothing different for this. Well, how about him on the uh, on the little Ebo solo too? He went off on that thing. A little, yeah, little that, extended. That was, that was well done. Yeah, the, the, that whole jam kind of lasted yeah. about a minute or two. Yeah, they really stretched that out. Yeah, not, not then, bad at uh, all. On UR, you know, listening to Matt on the, the cymbals at the end, just pounding on those cymbals added a lot of texture to the end of UR. Yeah, I thought this was a good section too. Now we're going to get into three. It feels like a nod to the old school fan here that loved the first three records because we're going to go Vitalogy, 10 Vitalogy, and none of them are going to be common songs at all, especially the first one. Satan's Bed is being broken out for this, and it was the only the 20th rendition. As we know now, I think they've done it 39 times, including the one that just happened weeks ago. I thought that this version was really good, like unexpectedly tight and bouncy. Mike has that really nice lick in the chorus that just, it's just fun. It kind of adds that extra flair to it. And then Ed, Ed gives the crowd the yeah. mic to sing this the is line. The yeah. Yeah. It's a moment that I think was made for New Jersey. Sure. Well, I like the the segue too because he comes off of the president improv on wish list, and then speaking of Satan, and then yeah, right, yeah, right. In, right into Satan's bed. That, that was a nice little touch. But yeah, yeah that he gives that you know never suck Satan's dick line to the crowd, and like they are up for it. Like it is a full sing along at that point. That was a great moment. It was played a total of nine times in 2006 compared to the 13 it was played in 1995, the year that song and that album was out. So, And yeah, I mean, they, they had only just brought it back a few weeks after the, you know, the State College debacle. So brave of them to bring it back. I think Albany was the one that came back and they definitely like, you know, 2006, it got played a lot, kind of a renaissance for uh, a little bit. For Satan's bed. So yeah, they didn't want to leave it on the, the State College version. So they worked on it, brought it back, and kind of had a a rejuvenation after that up up until just now, this past year. Yeah, they played Satan's Bed nine times in 2006. They played Nothing Man 3. Yep. 
explain that. I I, I can't. Hey. So yep. I'm just going to go into Garden. And for a lot of people that know about Garden's history, they know that 2006 is the year that it was tinkered with a little bit, where you have those heavy chords in the beginning. A lot of people, and by a lot of people, maybe just us, have coined it Soundgarden. Hint, hints, and it sounds like a very metal version of this. But even this, it was interesting because it felt like when you get into the chorus, it's held back. It doesn't have any drums. However, they kind of do like a little reprise of that chorus right after, which usually doesn't happen in the middle of Garden at all. And then towards the end, it was getting a little strange. It was getting a little convoluted there because you weren't really sure which piece was going where, and it felt like either Ed got sort of caught up or the band got sort of caught up and it, it just turned from there like sort of a okay this is a different version but we don't know what kind of different is going to be but i love getting the sound of this i love getting the feel that we don't talk about this kind of version of garden very often so yeah i i, I did enjoy it yeah it's like the headbangers ball version of garden like the beavis and butthead version where you throw the double horns up and, and start rocking out Another song that kind of had a, had a resurgence in 2006. They're kind of grouping all these together here. I think, you know, the, the quote from Jeff is that, you know, it's kind of like Jeremy, like, oh, sometimes the original version that we came up with is the best. So it didn't last long, but it's kind of a unique little footnote in the, in the history here. I, I like it. Yeah. And a lot of people that might not, you know, have heard this from 2006 shows might not have known it. I think yeah. that I, I used this on my wish list and a lot of people came back to me and they're like, I have never heard that out of Garden before. Where'd you pick <laughs> that up from? And, it's because we listen to a lot of shows on this podcast. Hate to break that news to you. Uh, whipping is going to finish this off, and Whipping is going to get you back into that momentum that songs like Save You and Grievance had all in the beginning of this set, because boy, is Whipping just a burst of speed there. Matt has a drum roll in this that is spectacular. <laughs> it was it was really very good and uh you could hear ed at the beginning kind of getting the crowd up like come on come on see i don't know if it was the crowd i thought it was more that because they kind of took a second after mm. garden and i think it was that ed wanted to transition out of garden right into oh, whipping so they can the get band, that fast yeah. start yeah you know okay could be but yeah like another another good performance here you, you needed something to kind of like and you know they'll do this late in the set you throw in a fast one it'll be like a luke in or spin the black circle or something or even a go and, and that's that's what we is doing here it's like give it one last push before you you get get to the end of the set no problem with that because yeah you're gonna end off pretty hard here too a lot of good rockers obviously uh life wasted into rearview mirror and wasted's getting the penultimate moment and like i mentioned before these tours it's usually up near the top. It's like, you know, sometimes they'll go Wasted Reprise into Life Wasted and into Severed Hand and then Worldwide Suicide. But here, Life Wasted, it, it kind of feels a little refreshing at this time period when they're not down-tuning the song. Because this is one I don't care for down-tune. But this feels, you know, like it has that early performance electricity to it not one that i listen to a whole lot now but this whole show you're burning calories and i think that this one you're flat out burning calories on as well 
and then we can get into rearview mirror which is a solid how many minutes long john nearly 10 minutes nearly 10 minutes yep. the track itself yep. is i think 9:59 yeah i think the song's like 9:40 maybe yeah yeah something like that so uh what's the first thing that kind of caught your ear on this rearview mirror i think it's jeff's dancey little baseline there during the jam that was awesome and then the forgive forget little improv is is very cool as well yeah just a, an outstanding performance of rearview mirror ho hum another one added to the list yeah and all that going on after ed's doing his lyrical improv and you know then it gets kind of real down low and it's allowing for the song to to build back up again i love when they do that because again that tease of that bass coming in that's 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 the definitive moment of the song and you know the end of this version i feel like you know for it being a 10 minute version almost ed sort of I guess gets a little winded because they were going really hard at this and he just kind of like he doesn't hit the scream I think Jeff comes in and and you know helps him out with some of the backing vocals on the last lines but it kind of is a testament to to what they did here and did you hear the it sounded like he might have lost control of the mic too because it sounded like a mic dropped or something did you notice that mm. no wouldn't be surprised though I'm sure he probably you know got the guitar on so he probably did a jump and probably knocked something over i'm sure they were yeah just going crazy this is one of the highlights of the night yep 10 minute version yep. of rear of your mirror Get much better not the that. longest though we've seen longer but there's about 15 there. somewhere yeah we'll it's do like the... 12 i think one of the south american ones is 12 or 13 yeah yeah i thought that was 15 hmm. maybe we'll, we'll have to we'll check have to yeah but that show is on our radar so i have to go back to that uh, evolution episode that we did we talked about it that's correct and we'll talk about patreon in now because we're into the encore and now it's time to pause for station identification and talk about all that stuff that goes on the patreon to start this off i'm going to give thanks to two brand new patrons joining the horizon leg that's excellent glad to see you guys there and hopefully you guys are getting the most out of your brand new subscription that you can because there's over 100 episodes out there so let's thank them both dakota duval thank you so much dakota and i thank noticed you. that dakota also pitched in a few bucks for our breath campaign and, and printing out those signs so yeah gl glad dakota's on board and can't wait to talk to him about his shows and his uh history with pearl jam at some point in the future and then brian smith thank you very much brian smith yeah Thanks to Dakota and Brian. That's amazing, especially to jump on that horizon leg there. We really appreciate that. Yeah, I hope you guys get a chance to go back and dig into the back catalog that's on Patreon there. Part of, I guess, the front catalog on Patreon is that we released the Grievance Letterman episode, as yep. we talked about a little bit earlier, and that was fun. It's a real short one. It's probably about 25 minutes or so long, if that. 
and we're going to have more for the future too. Nothing man evolution. It's in the works and we're really working hard to get it out. Maybe the next week or so to record it and then finishing it off in a little bit. And then we talked about before the show that we're going to go back to doing a 1991 show very soon because we haven't done a lot of those so yeah we need to pick up on those and those are short those are nice but if you are either brand new to patreon or you haven't joined and kind of need to know what what it's about over there there's just so many different episodes from all the evolution stuff the evolution episodes are taking a song and going through the entire uh, basically discography of the song and figuring out when things changed, you know, when what stories happen and telling all the best ones. And we've done a bunch up to, you said, River Mirror, to give, give him a Fly, to Present Tense, to Release, like all. I think we've hit a lot of the popular songs so far, and there's so many more to do. So The best thing to do, go to liveonfourlegs.com, podcast episodes, it's right there, Patreon exclusives. You can go through and look at all the different ones we've done, the Bridge School series, the Devo, the Evolution, the Late Night. Everything's right there for you. And also on liveonfourlegs.com, you can actually sign up to Patreon through the website. So all you do is you go to the website, and I think on every page you'll see an orange button that says Become a Patron. And you can do so easily just by clicking that and joining up joining our team also we're still working toward towards our big goal get 200 patrons by episode number 200 we're somewhere in the 180s so we're just going to keep working towards it guys and uh once again thank you everybody that all of the 180 that have joined and even all the past people that have joined as well for making this all happen this has been great we mentioned our late night series version of grievance that we just did and i'm going to mention here a couple other episodes of our podcast and other pearl jam podcasts that will be on very very soon let's start with earlier this week where we actually had on pearl jams basically their beat writer he's always on top of things he writes for variety writes for spin and he's the guy that wrote the almanac pj20 book and he's a fantastic guest. We've had him on before. Jonathan Cohen joined us. We released that on Monday. He talks to us about his thoughts on the 2022 tour. And we kind of get into like what could happen next, what happened then, and a lot of things that he liked and he'd like to see. It's a good conversation. Always a good conversation there with him. So that's an episode to definitely check out, which is out obviously now on the main platforms. Then let's talk about what we did for other Pearl Jam podcasts. Last week, I was on State of Love and Trust podcast with Dave Jantosh from Live Footsteps, and we got to talk a little bit about the tour and a lot of our tour thoughts. And uh, just thank you for both Jason and Paul having us on the show. Just really kind of them. Haven't been on that show before, and now I have hit a trifecta of other Pearl Jam podcasts with Jamly Matters and Better Band as well. And speaking of Better Band, John had just recorded for Hard to Imagine for Better Band, I believe. As I'm speaking on this, it is out right now. So definitely a lot of things to listen to if you're interested in catching up and just listening to more of the great Pearl Jam content that is out there. It's very, very good. Let's mention two other things real quick. I mentioned the St. Louis Hope and Brews in the Lou event, and I just want to remind everybody that's going to happen on the day of the St. Louis show, so hope to see you all there. Just going to keep reminding you guys every week, and also for MSG, going to be bringing some breath signs around and handing them out, but we need to be funded on that. That's a different funding than through Patreon, so if you're interested in helping that out, just send to the Venmo account at Live on Four Legs. $5 $5 will get you one entry into our raffle. We're giving away some prizes, some posters, a couple shirts, and it, it'll be nice because we really want to get out there with those signs and create, recreate, I should say, history back from 1998. So the band gets to see on the stage throughout the crowd. They get to see all the signs again and it might bring back a nice little memory for them. So that's kind of what we're hoping to do there. All right, back to the rock. Ed says the great Northeast has been very, very good to this band. We appreciate your presence. Every single one of you, a lot of lives and personality out there. I know we're all different, but we're all the same. That's a book I read to my child. Sometimes a lot of challenges and we're going to make it through them all together. It's a waste of reprise bed and then man of the hour. And then afterwards is going to be the second overall performance of parachutes. 
man of the hour though i was blown away by this version and it kind of took me back a little bit to the movie and i don't exactly remember what scene it was in the movie but it just hearing this version made me think of all the build and all the high parts and then once you get down to just like ed singing the chorus again by himself no backing in there it just felt like you were on this ride just theatrical through all throughout emotional and yeah he poured everything into it on this one It's not one we talk about a whole lot, and it's not one I, I end up thinking about a whole lot, but boy, 2022, if they don't bring this back at least once, it's it's a it's a disappointment. This this version especially is very, very good. Yeah, and they are seated here. I think you see a video of parachutes where they're all they've got the chairs out, which was cool to see and a little tie into what we saw in Amsterdam. So yeah, I agree. I would love to see this come back. And yeah, I think it's, you know, in Big Fish, it's, I think this is the big kind of climactic moment of the movie too, near the end where pretty sure the where hour comes in, but yeah, this version just absolutely soars as much as something like given to fly or, or in my tree or some of those corduroy, some of those classic ones that we know and love do. Then we get into parachutes. That one is only been played 22 times and this is the second performance it's kind of the middle or the, really the end of this leg in may and they've only done it two times and it's dedicated to ed said wilton and denise so rare to hear overall but definitely at the time they were still working for it not one of my favorite avocado songs by any stretch but for the second time to perform it it seems like they had it covered pretty well maybe some hesitation in spots it wasn't loose at all you know it, it was pretty yeah. kind of like okay wait for the changes here wait for the changes there but I, it sounded pretty good and it sounded like they were ready for the next time that they would do it i think they might have felt more confident doing it this one's actually one of my favorites off of avocado and i know a lot of people don't like it but it is different and it's, you know, a lot of people compare it at the time to like one of those later Beatles kind of tracks where it's got that kind of rhythm to it. For the second performance, it's very good. And there is a video of this one as well. You can see Ed kind of like emoting with his hands and like kind of acting out a little bit and he's getting into it. It was, it was good. This is a, another one that hasn't been played very often. I like that they kind of give this crowd, especially, you know, this is a night two show so they can go in and you know dig a little deeper into the catalog and pull out some of these that, that don't often get played but yeah i, I really like this back to back i thought parachutes was good here you know in comparison to what the main set is and then what you're going to get in encore too this is kind of like i wouldn't say the cool down but it's definitely the more emotional side of pearl jam in this whole entire encore until you hit mm. Uh, Crazy Mary alive and I think that the balance is, is worked out pretty perfectly because imagine if they came out and did all the same kind of things that they did in the main set just kept kind of bombarding you with that and then doing that again in the second encore like they did it would have felt a little out of place it would have been a little empty yeah you need these songs with some emotional weight to kind of give it an anchor and black is the perfect epitome of that like that is what that song does so yeah, per perfect spot here. You know, I, I love Black, Crazy Mary, Alive, because these three are all very different, but put together, they all fit in so nicely. Black is the emotional one, this version being 
very sorrowful, a little bit more delicate with that sound of Stone's Gretch, and getting with the crowd clapping along at the end, leading for Ed to go into the We Belong Together tag after doing a little bit of The Police So Lonely. And not even that, but the crowd was singing the I Hope Someday You'll Have a Beautiful Life part. Uh, yeah, like that, I mean, that gets you all emotional. Crazy Mary kind of gets you up a little bit because that's the one. Crowd participation, singing the spelling of loitering there, and that was fantastic. Yeah. And they they probably know from the last time they were in the area, like, okay, is the ghost here? Is the ghost going to break <laughs> out? And I'm Catch sure a lot of people. There, but... Yeah, a lot of people were or might have been thinking that in the crowd, but no, this is that's a good version of it too. But like that's the fun one, that's the communal one where they're all drinking then alive. This version especially, just very anthemic. It just felt like, you know, the cathartic, powerful, little bit of party atmosphere, but I think a lot of people were just more engaged with what's going on on stage and how tight this version was, and this is the one that Obviously, it's the first one that a lot of people will go back to and say that they had a connection with and that it's still connecting with people in this kind of part of the set list at this time period and still today, obviously, in this time period, like a live, well put together with these three. I thought that they were all fantastic. Just special, just special to get these kind of three all in a row. We don't think about it in that aspect, but three totally different songs gelling together very very nicely for the end we had a nice crowd moment in in satan's bed that we talked about kind of a a funny one there but these three i thought were where the crowd really became part of the show and you know especially at the beginning of black amazing you know because i just getting chills listening to it and for this to be the only time that he's ever done a little bit of, of so lonely as a tag there you getting a little bit of insight into what that song is about like he's letting you peek in the window a little bit he's pulling back the shade a little bit But Alive especially, you know, three days after this was the storytellers where they talked about, you know, the curse being lifted and all that. So Alive in in 2006 definitely had a little bit of a renaissance in its own kind of way. And it became the kind of modern version of Alive that we talk about and that that still happens, you know, that that closed a lot of shows this year. And we've seen it even escalate even more in 2022 to that more of a prominent spot there and uh we listen to a live almost every week and like some of them can kind of run together and be a little cookie cutter but not not this one around this time in 2006 like alive was was one of the showstoppers this is incredible and a couple other things to mention here first of all i just want to say with black especially coming off of two songs out of that with with man of the hour that elicited a like just sadness listening to that like that almost got me teary-eyed just hearing the thing because just Mike fitting in with what the emotion that kind of invested with the song and just taking that and he's amazing at channeling, especially for this song, what the feel of the song is and bringing that to his section at the end. And, and this one was just kind of tapping into a little bit of that sadness and you you never know what you're going to get with it. And, you know, sometimes it's very exciting. Sometimes it's very anthemic. Sometimes it's, you know, a little bit more powerful, impactful. And then it's times like this where it can be sorrowful and it can still work really, really well because it's eliciting some kind of emotion out of you. And then in crazy Mary, I think we got to mention this because there is no duel at all. It's just the Boone right. Gaspar show. Yep. Yep. So, give, Mike, give Mike a rest. Mm-hmm, I'm fine with that. Give Boom the moment. Absolutely. And Encore 2. I'm going to just talk about a little bit what Ed says and then have a little thing on Encore 2 here. I've already said thanks. I can only say it again. Thank you, my morning jacket. We're happy to witness that summer has arrived on the continent. Hope it's a good one for you. Me- forgot to mention during Black that we wanted to dedicate it to Sebastian, who is a young man but the song was playing when he was coming out of the birth canal. So welcome to the earth, Sebastian. 
don't want to waste any more time because we got work to do and so do you and uh yeah he's right you're coming out of the gate the first five here are all just going to be blistering fast again it's going back to that same identity and and at this point like the crowd is amped up because you're you have all of that that just happened to those three songs all in a row they're big heavy hitters that the crowd loves and now the crowd's ready for anything especially with a live that you kind of expect to be as the ending of of the second encore and then to start it off with last exit going into evolution going into glorified g and then comatose and then leash like that right there that's that's different for an encore too because usually you want a sing-along in there you, you know you might get ribbed up with one or two you know you might get some kind of special guest to kind of cover but no these are all pearl jam songs that hit really heavy and just felt like non-stop bangers all five of these phenomenal you know i'm not a huge fan of of comatose that much anymore but i thought that this one hit really well just all of it put together just made for an extremely powerful ending of this night Hmm. i'm gonna disagree so this didn't really didn't really do anything for me i like last exit being later in the night we've talked about it it has a you know this is this is my last exit that makes sense give it a little more of a prominent spot here but it's kind of become the joke on our setlist drafts oh you know someone's gonna have to take glorified g in the second encore and here we are glorified g's in the second encore you know people know if they listen to the show this show is, is great but spliced in are a couple of my songs that i that don't care for too much so that put a little bit of a damper on it for me after the evolution i was like okay great here we go like if you skip from do the evolution to leash and like leash is kind of the novelty one at this point where you know they had just brought it back after 12 11 13 years. years 11 years whatever it was since 95 probably so that's the one that like is going to be the, the big moment for people that you know all the campaigns you know play leash you fucking pussies and all that and leash is good like he sneaks a little bit of the lucky face in at the end you can kind of tell that like it's it's not 1993 not 1991 he's not feeling the same about it as he was so you would see it kind of change over the next few years and you know now in, in 2022 it's gone back the other way and he is kind of feeling it the way he did originally we've gone back to the the angrier version but it's felt a little worst for me i could do without glorified g and comatose here it doesn't do anything for me i even thought Bob O'Reilly was a little flat. It didn't really hit the big, like, thunderous moment that it should be. Felt a little rushed. And again, you're, you're getting 31, 32 songs here. The, this Encore 2 just didn't really coalesce like it probably should have. I thought it was a little bit disjointed. Yeah, I totally disagree with that. I think yeah. it was just, just fuel throughout the whole entire thing. And I thought that Bob O'Reilly definitely did have those moments of kind of catharticism and getting the last big big sing along out at the end there like and holding out those notes at the end and make it more powerful that way ah oh, that was it was just it was so good and i don't mind glorified g being in there because for this especially they made it work they turned it up a little bit they turned up the rpms a little bit and really kind of made it fly and Ed is very intense on the vocals, and I think we sh- we should mention here that it was dedicated to good friend and mentor Dick Cheney. And mm-hmm. real quick, isn't it weird that one of the most evil Republicans in history is now condemning the most evil Republican in history? Seems a little odd. But but that's a little ironic too, because didn't he shoot a guy in the face? Dick Cheney shot a guy. I don't know if it was in the face. I think it was in the arm. But I yeah, Dick it was in the face. Was um, it really? Whatever. I think so. You know, obviously, you see what's happening in, you can't say the second encore, you can say the first encore of this year, and then even in the last couple years, it kind of have faded out and kind of died down a little bit. But just to get these five and how just insanely fast and insanely crowd-pleasing they all were, you're not going to get this at any show that you attend now. You have to look at these from a bootleg standpoint, and I loved it. It was just great intensity. That's the way I like to finish a show, because you like to finish on such a high point. Bobo was on a high point, and even let better. You said before with Alive that it could get cookie cutter. The one that gets cookie cutter for me is always Ledbetter. 
This one felt uh, much better than any normal Ledbetter usually does. And that's due to Mike. Mike was just lighting it up on this. A lot and of lyric changes, too, in that you a lot of lyric ch- around this time, around the from 2003 to 2008, you were getting uh, some really good versions of Yellow Ledbetter because he was he was playing around with the lyrics and really, you know, telling the story of it. Yeah, kind of the anti-war sentiment, of course. And sometimes what happens with Ledbetter is because of the it's the end of the night, because the band is feeling like, all right, we did it. It's kind of like their last thing where it's not like supposed to be this amazing performance, but it's supposed to just be a last moment to say thanks to, to the fans and all that. So they just play it and then they kind of move on their way. But this one, it felt like they put emphasis on getting a good version of Ledbetter out there, which really doesn't seem to happen very often. Mike takes it away when it comes to Star Spangled Banner there. Like, we, this was very new at the time. This was only the fifth time that they had done it, so feeling pretty fresh on it and just pulling out all different tricks. You know, stuff that I hadn't heard in a version of the National Anthem when he's done it before. Just very, very good. For Ledbetter, obviously, just kind of, in a sense, blown away by Ledbetter. I don't get to say that very often, mm-hmm. but whole entire Encore too. That was that was my bag. I know it wasn't yours, obviously, but that's that's where we both stand on it. So now we're going to get into the point where we pick our three stars of the program. I think you're going first, so get yeah. right to it. Number three is going to be Garden, uh, getting the uh, the quote unquote sound Garden version. It was nice we hadn't hadn't heard that in a long time so gave the song a fresh take on it was was cool to hear and um definitely thought it added something to the show number two i'm gonna go with man of the hour amazing amazing performance that soared as much as anything else on this night and as, as some of their best stuff does and then my number one's rearview mirror just blew me away nearly 10 minutes not a second wasted definitely go and check that out that's my number one all right. Um, it's going to be the same for the first one because my number three is also going to be Man of the Hour. Again, eliciting that kind of emotion from that. And you mentioned Ben Arroyo before. That was the version where everybody was on the edge of their seats. Like, we haven't heard this before. What's coming next? And then once they get to those parts and it sort of blossoms and people are like, whoa, just blown away by how fantastic a song this is. I, I, I get to feel that a lot with this song. And especially because we don't hear it a whole lot, you know, when it does come up and it does feel fresh, that happens to me again. It's like Ben Arroyo all over again. My number two, I'm actually going to make it the entire Encore 2. That's how much I love this. It felt like a big time show. All seven of these songs just felt put together and getting him at the end of the set. And I, I, you know, you, you said that some of it might've been rushed. And I know that there was a show a couple weeks ago where I might've mentioned that the ending was rushed. I didn't, I didn't get that feel because it got just a lot of firepower from everything and just all being in a row. There wasn't like a standout performance. I might even say that Ledbetter was the one that kind of caught me the most, but boy, everything here to the finish was just, I, I would go home very, very happy if I had that at the end of a set. My number one is gone. They just got to play it more often. And you're kind of talking into the void here when you're saying that, because if they didn't do it then, you know, after 2006 more, a lot of what happens with the avocado songs is that after they are in their prime of the tour year for the record, they slip a little bit and they don't have that same kind of bright, shiny feel to it. And Gone is one that's very good afterwards, but I don't think it had this flair for the dramatics that it had on this version. Loved it. Uh, it's my number one moment. You know, you're going to have to uh, bring some Sharpies and you're going to have to write Gone on the back of your breath signs from SG. <laughs> and after they play Breath, everybody can turn it around and it'll say Gone and then they, they can play Gone after that. But John, how about we just put a spotlight on Gone and make that the one that's the moment at Camden because be. now you're going back to a little bit of history. It They've never be back to the original germ of the song. Yeah. From what I remember, I don't, I don't know if they ever played it in Madison square garden. It might've been in one of those 2008 shows, but back to Jersey, they might be thinking about it then. So you just never Good know. Point. Yep. All right. 
what do you got for a rating for this? This will be interesting. Uh, this is a very, very good show. I'm going to give it a very, very good rating that reflects that. I don't think it's up in the, the classic range, so I'm going to give this one an eight, eight and a half. Very, very good. I was at an eight and a half until I heard the second encore, and it just made me just so happy to hear that. I wanted to kind of get up and do some of the show things and kind of break a sweat. It made me very excited to go to a show that I'm going to this week of Rage Against the Machine that's going to have a a lot of those kind of songs and a lot of that kind of firepower. Because of that, I lifted that one up 0.5, and I think that this was an excellent show before the second encore, but the second encore feeling like being something special at a Pearl Jam show. Yeah, I think uh, this is a nine show for me. It's not one that I don't think gets talked about a whole lot, but now that we've talked about it, hopefully it can open up some, some minds there. What do you think? We'll see. It's very good. Now we got some more shows to do in the next coming month that are going to focus on, again, a lot of the locations that we're going to do. And um, let's get into what we're going to do next week. And we're going to go to 2014 next week. That's an era that we've kind of dropped a lot of the lightning bolt stuff this year, but we are going back to it because A, it is a Patreon request, and B, it's focusing on St. Louis. And that is one of the places that both of us will be attending and where we're going to get into the last time they were there for sure. And then the coming weeks, we're going to do a couple of interesting things. We're going to do a Denver show from 1994, which has a couple of very interesting moments and key moments from their history that you might not recognize. And then we'll do the Quebec City show that happened in 2016. That's very, very good since they are opening the tour with that. And then we will cap it off. I think it's going to come out the day after the Hamilton show happens, but we'll be doing Hamilton 2005, which is a cool show in and of itself. So with all that being said, thank you all for listening. If you listened and you liked what you heard, then why don't you head on over to Apple podcast and Spotify and give us a little rating, subscribe, give us a little rating. The five-star rating helps us and gets us visible throughout the podcast circles. And if you're on Apple podcast, you like what you heard, you want to say a little bit more, something nice about us, please be something nice about us. Then leave us a comment. Even if it's just, Hey, these guys talk about the shows and they're knowledgeable and what they're talking about. Or I love hearing the music mention that. And hopefully the next person will see that and be like, Oh, all right, I'll give these guys a shot. Because that's all we're asking for. We're just asking for a shot. That's it. That's it. And we're thankful that you listening today gave us that shot. So next week, we can hopefully get more people taking another shot. So shots for everybody. Obviously, being in New Jersey, you want to do those shots, right? Shot, 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 shot. Yeah, that falls flat with this crowd. Anyway, I'm going to end this on out. This may be the end. We're here, but not for much longer. And although we may be parting ways, miss you already. Miss you all ways. We're one down in preparation for the final leg of 2022. And boy, I think we're all excited. I almost ate a penny and thought it was a pretzel. No, where are we today? We are packing for Pearl Jam. Let's we'll see what we have. Why don't you give us a tour? Oh, well, that's beer. This is beer. Okay. There's over 100 beers here. Over 100? Are you sure? Oh, no, wait. Once we, we're we going to add another one like this. And then we'll have 100 beers. Over. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Pat McGurn. So let's go to the for free parking. Yeah. We went to school with us. Pat McGloin is a uh, former, he's an alumni of St. Francis Sales School in Bankton, New Jersey, and Paul High School. So, we go way back. And it's tough. You know those huge porta potties? Oh, yeah. They're, they're, they're like in line. It's like a uh, giant uh, truck. Yeah. Like eight guys. It's amazing. Yeah. I was like, what the hell are eight guys coming out of that thing for? And this girl next to me was like, it's just a giant truck. You know, pee at once. And like, we skipped the entire line. Unbelievable. Excuse me, listen. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, camera on camera. Get back here. Camera on camera. Yeah. Yeah. Ha <laughs> <laughs>
Dick's being really stupid right now. I think Ron and Bay when a freeze out always. Jake Foster, you can just call me Ron. <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> I want to clarify for the record. Ronald Aya Bates. That was my shit. I don't really have a middle name, but you can call me Aya Bates. Oh, you know what? I'll make one up. Most people call me asshole anyway, so the AO's separate asshole. It's an asshole. Works. <laughs> Here we go. Look at him over there! Leave me alone! I got him, I got him. Nice and just nice shot! Oh, I'm gonna 